Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar. I'm Nicola Palfrey, um, a clinical psychologist and the National Clinical Manager for Headspace Schools. And I'd like to welcome the just over 400 uh, participants who have joined us for tonight. Um, we've got a fantastic group tonight uh, joining us for the important topic of managing transitions for young people, which we know is a really big issue always in life, but it never more so than in the uh, current circumstance. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge on behalf of MHPN, the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia, upon which our webinar presenters and participants are joining us tonight. We wish to pay our respect to the elders past present and future for the memories, traditions, culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. So we have a great panel tonight, which uh, no doubt you are somewhat familiar with. We have sent out the buyers, so we won't go into a huge amount of detail because we're really interested to hear from them tonight rather than um, spend too much time in the uh, upfront. So I'm going to throw straight to the panel to get them to introduce themselves. Um, first of all, we have Dr. Michael Carr-Greg. Uh, welcome, Michael. Um, I've got a question for you, Michael, to start off with, if that's okay. Sure. So, Michael, you recently ran a masterclass webinar on the grieving adolescent or adolescents going through grieving. Can you tell a little bit, tell us a little bit about that uh, session, please? Oh, well, thanks very much. Yes, um, it's a passion of mine. I don't think that um, we're very well prepared uh, as a society to help anyone um, deal with their grief, but particularly not uh, young people. And uh, they grieve in a very distinctive way in little spurts when they think that the circumstances are ready uh, for them. And uh, the most important thing, I think, when you're dealing with grieving adolescents is to listen really carefully and be directed by them. And that was the main message. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I agree. I think it's something that um, it's good to come out of the shadow so we can talk about these things because then we can address them more clearly. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. Um, the next panellist I'd like to introduce is Meg Corduroy. Meg is a colleague of mine and I welcome her. She's joining us from, from Queensland and Meg is a social worker by trade. Um, Meg, as you know very well, a lot of people think about Headspace, they think about the centres and it, as a kind of therapeutic service. Um, there's a bit more to Headspace than that. I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit a bit about what other services that Headspace offer. Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Nicola. And hi, everybody. Hope you're having a good evening. Um, so Headspace has a range of other services, actually. The centre network, as we refer to it, is only one part of uh, Headspace national offerings. So we have the Headspace Schools Division, which is actually the division that I work within, um, and that has a different, a bunch of different contracts and programs within it. But also um, there's a really large online footprint of Headspace. So we have our eHeadspace service, which operates, um, staff sit in the national office in Melbourne, and um, that service operates from 9 a.m. to 1 a.m. every day. Um, and you can engage with clinicians via email, phone or web chat. Um, and that also includes family and friends. Uh, they can access that service too, which I think is pretty fantastic and that's free. Um, and there's some other things too. Headspace has a digital work and study program. Um, that's for anyone 15 to 25 years old. Um, they also have a career mentoring program that's for 18 to 25 years. Uh, and it's really easy to register your interest for those programs. You can do it online, you can just go and fill in a form or give them a call at eHeadspace. Um, and often there isn't a wait time for those services, so they're really fantastic. And um, there's a couple of other things, there's like group chats that you can access as well. Mm. Um, yeah, a bit of variety. That's great. Thank you. We might get into that a bit more as we go along tonight. So yeah. thank you, Meg, and welcome. And finally, I'd like to welcome Arne Rubenstein. Um, Anne, we originally had you listed as a GP and we had a good discussion in the prep for this that you've left GP land and moved in to start your rites of passage business. So I'd be really interested to hear a little bit about that decision and, and what prompted you to do that. 
Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, and good evening, everybody. So I, I had two medical careers, first of all, as a general practitioner for around uh, 10 years, and then I spent another 10 years as an emergency medicine doctor. And one of the big things I noticed as a general practitioner was that I was treating a lot of older people, and it seemed like uh, a lot of their conditions came down to there was a lot of addiction involved and those addictions might have been drugs and alcohol but could also be food or work or unhealthy relationships, all sorts of different things. And, and it appeared to me that a lot of the issues that they were uh, dealing with actually started when they were teenagers. Um, and then when I started working as an emergency medicine doctor, I saw what I called the over-representation of teenagers in the, in the emergency department, and I saw a procession of boys coming in who had, had accidents, uh, you know, that involved speed, height, wheels, jumping, anything that they could do to sort of test their mortality. And unfortunately, I saw also a lot of girls who were... Uh, drinking or, or taking drugs or, or just getting into situations which were really completely wrong for them and, and often that they would regret for the rest of their lives. And, and I couldn't find anything that was really addressing what I was seeing. And, and when I started looking outside the box and I discovered that Indigenous communities all over the world and traditional communities and many of the major religions would create a process to support their boys and girls at that stage where they were becoming adults and actually create a ceremony to celebrate and acknowledge the fact that they were transitioning from children to adults and to support them to find what was inside them, what was their passion, what was their gift, what was their spirit that they were going to take into the world. So from that, we started running some contemporary rites of passage and basically just took over my life. And so I left my medical career. Now we run programs uh, all around Australia and we've set up programs in about 30 countries around the world. Fantastic. Thank you. I look forward to hearing more about it. I think it's, you know, the, a lesson for all of us about as we move forward and, and things change. There's also, you know, not the baby in the bathwater scenario. What, what should we take with us? What's worked really well for, for generations? Um, so yeah, that's great. So welcome. I hope everybody who's joining us can see that we're going to have a um, great triangulation of perspectives as we talk about this topic tonight. So I'm going to go through now really quickly some of the housekeeping so we can get into the good stuff. Um, so first of all, in terms of ground rules for tonight, all of us um, joining, we've got hundreds of people joining, which is wonderful. Um, of course, in any of these circumstances, we ask you to be respectful of each other, the participants and the panellists. Um, keep topics we want to hear from you in the chat box. There's also questions and we'll go through where you can feed through that, that through to us, where you can chat with each other and where you can put questions through to the panel in a little while. Um, we also have technical support available, 1800 209 031. All of that information should be in your um, email that you received to come into the session tonight. You can click on the information icon on the lower right hand corner of your screen to get support as well. Try refreshing your browser, go in, go out, those sorts of things. Um, we've also got a platform which we're excited about. It's pretty familiar, I think, to a lot of us perhaps a year ago. Um, some of us had some notion of these platforms and now it's Zoom, Teams, all of those sorts of things. You should be very familiar. But the information icon is in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Get that information there. Um, to ask the speakers a question, click on the speech bubble icon in the lower right hand corner. Um, I'll be monitoring that as we go through tonight and feed those through to the, the panellists at the end. To chat, there's two speech bubbles in the top right hand corner of your screen. So that's where you can chat with each other, share um, reflections as we go along as well. Um, you can change your slide and video layout by clicking on the icon with two arrows inside a circle in the top right corner of the window. This makes the video larger so you can see the panellists more clearly if that's what you prefer. If you'd like to change your view to slide only or video only, click on the square icon with an up and down arrow on the bottom right hand corner. Hopefully that is clear. Um, you can play around with it and hopefully get what you want. 
Um, so this evening we're going to have um, what is traditional for our panellists and for MHP and webinars. Each of our um, fantastic panel are going to give us about five minutes of their perspective from their professions and their point of view around the case study that you've all um, shared um, and hopefully are across. And then we're going to open it up for questions. So what we're trying to address tonight in terms of our learning outcomes is to look to identify the mental health indicators in the context of difficult life stage transitions for young adults. So what are we looking out for and what can we do about them? Discuss tips and strategies that can help a young adult feel supported through these situations and discuss the importance of collaboration and appropriate referrals for young adults going through life stage transitions. Okay, so let's get to it. I'm really excited, first of all, to throw to Michael for his perspective on our case study. So over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Nicola. Well, I always look at uh, young people in terms of, um, as I guess a child and adolescent psychologist would, through a developmental lens. And um, I'm actually a little bit worried about Chloe. I think she's in a uh, been in a really difficult space. I think a lot of her key developmental tasks that I've listed on this slide have actually been significantly impacted upon by uh, the COVID lockdown and her circumstances. Um, really, most young people um, ultimately have kind of like three questions that they need to, to answer. Who am I? Am I normal? in their sense, and where am I going? And this identity formation really is um, uh, greatly facilitated by uh, Anna's right, rites of passage, but also some healthy risk-taking behaviour. Um, and uh, clearly, uh, Chloe hasn't been able to engage terribly much in that in the last wee while. Uh, and a really important predictor of wellbeing in young people is having uh, a bunch of hopefully pro-social peers, and clearly she hasn't been able to do very much of that either. Uh, then I think about her capacity to emancipate psychologically from her adult carers, Brenda and Pete, and she hasn't really been able to do that either because uh, the, the family have been in lockdown and her capacity to hang out with her mates and take those healthy risks have been significantly compromised. And what's worse, and one of the reasons why I'd be very worried about Chloe is from an educational point of view, remember she was a high achiever, but year 12 has been an academic disaster for her. Uh, she, she and remote learning were not, were not friends. Um, remember the family had one computer, a slow internet, and uh, all she really wanted was to go into nursing. But unfortunately, um, it would appear that she didn't get the ATAR that she needed. So when I'm looking at young people, I think about them in terms of these developmental tasks. And this is uh, clearly been problematic. The, uh, the COVID experience has really um, stopped her from successfully, I think, tackling all of these tasks. If we could have the next slide, please. <clears throat> the other way I like to look at young people is to see them in terms of their um, five worlds that a lot of them uh, live in. Obviously, what's going on inside uh, them, their inner world, their family, their school, uh, their friends, and of course, their digital world, um, what, what we know is that there is a balance of risk and protective factors in all young people. Um, a lot of this stuff comes from the University of Washington and the social development uh, model by Catalano, Hawkins and Miller, almost uh, six decades of research, which clearly shows that if you have uh, the, if this perspective and you do a sort of forensic um, uh, kind of formulation of what's been going on in the young person's world, you can actually get to see where you go next, which is obviously to minimise the risk factors and increase the protective factors. Uh, now, certainly from a family point of view, this is a family that was hit hard both 
mum and dad lost their jobs, the emotional temperature at home has been significantly elevated. So we might be looking at some family work to help them uh, in that respect. Um, with, with her, it says that she's, the case study tells us she's sad and disappointed. I wonder whether that's a little bit more than, than sadness and whether or not in fact she may have developed um, a depressive illness Certainly all of the um, the facts there, I've actually seen many young people like this during the lockdown and many of them have in fact developed um, depression and a, a side order of anxiety and substance abuse as well. So that wouldn't be at all surprising. We don't really know very much about her digital world and um, not terribly much from the case study about her peer world, but it's a fair bet that this is a young woman who really loved her basketball. She hasn't been able to, to, to do that. She couldn't emancipate. She couldn't even complete her driving test. And the only thing she really wanted to do is travel overseas, and she's not going to be able to do that either. So this is another different way of looking at young people. Next slide, please. So in order to get this information, how would you do it? Well, the answer comes from our wonderful friends at Headspace. Um, some years ago, they took Golden Ring and Cohen's 1988 article in Contemporary Pediatrics, which was known as the Head's Psychosocial Biopsy, was written for GPs and just an idea of how you would have a conversation with a young person, not read it as a list, but certainly incorporate it into your discussions, your respectful, hopefully, discussions with the young person. And I really love the, the layout on, on this, um, you gently go through a home and education, employment, obviously eating, exercise, activities, drugs and alcohol, sexuality and gender, and then the mental health components and, of course, the safety. So, look, it's a, uh, a pretty straightforward um, kind of method that I have with, with young people. Single most important thing as far as Chloe is concerned is I'd want to get rapport, hear her story and um, whack in a little bit of psychoeducation. Can we have the next slide, please? And I would use some psychometric tests because that's what psychologists do. Um, some of you are probably bored senseless by psychometrics, so I won't go that into any great detail other than I think it's really important as psychologists that we, we measure uh, what we can, uh, and I particularly enjoy using the um, the K10 with my general practice and um, social work colleagues because it's such a, a clear cut indication of how young people are going. And the next one, please. So the key interventions for Chloe, hypothetically, um, if as I suspect she might have um, depression or anxiety, would be around psychoeducation, using the wonderful resources at Headspace, Beyond Blue, um, reach out, um, probably do some um, CBT, uh, maybe IPT or ACT uh, with her, certainly the family therapy, general well-being. I don't think anyone on this panel is going to disagree with the benefits of a bit of exercise, um, looking at um, the diet, the sleep. I would actually also recommend some e-therapy with her, maybe some mood gym, maybe use some of the smartphone apps, and most importantly of all, thinking outside of the box, maybe a little hypnosis, and who knows, she might love animals, we'll do some equine therapy. Back to you, Nicola. Thank you, Michael, <laughs> incredibly efficient whip through of that, and I think, um uh, that, that thorough assessment, I think it gives us a really good grounding, but one of the things that also I think can do for young people like Chloe is when they hear it out loud, it gives them um, a bit of a grounding of, oh, no wonder I feel a bit wobbly, you know, because there is a lot going on. So I think there's something to be said for helping people articulate exactly what they're going through to feel validated by what they're um, experiencing. But that's great. Um, we're going to throw to Meg now for her perspective. So I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Meg. Great, thank you. Hi everyone again. Um, I was thinking it might be useful to start with uh, looking at a definition of a transition. So that is the process or period of changing from one state or condition to another. Um, for me, based on the case study, and, and obviously this is the topic of our webinar tonight, um, Chloe is undergoing a significant transition and that's from adolescence to young adulthood. 
Um, I think in terms of this transition, she's experiencing lots of changes that would be of interest um, in terms of a social work lens. So we'd be looking at a big change to her typical routine. Um, most young people have spent the first 18 or so years of their life in some form of care or schooling. Um, and Chloe is now 18 and she's thrust into the big wide world and what does that look like for her now um, in terms of her day to day. I'd be thinking about the expectations, um, both internalised expectations for Chloe, but also from others, um, and also her sense of self, her role, her purpose. So similar to what Michael has already touched on, I guess, in terms of that developmental um, focus. I think a really, really big one for me, though, is her support network. Um, what does that look like now? During school, young people are quite fortunate, I guess, that they have an, um, an inbuilt support network in their peers, in teaching staff, um, in guidance offices or in uh, school psychs and school leadership. Um, of course, not every young person has a positive experience of help seeking in school, um, but for, a, I guess, a majority, that support network does function to a degree for them. So for Chloe leaving school, what does that look like now? Um, so transition, essentially, I guess some key words that jump out to me would be instability and uncertainty. And when I look at the case study, I also think about how this has been compounded by the global pandemic, COVID-19. So not only is Chloe experiencing the, state, the states of instability or uncertainty a result of her transition from adolescence to young adulthood, but also in living through um, something that I think not many of us would have ever expected, this um, type of pandemic. So Michael alluded to it before, but really there's been major disruption to her schooling, to um, meaning making activities for Chloe, to her supports, her peers, um, and for me, I think this combination uh, has resulted in her presenting issues of low mood and lack of motivation um, and feeling, you know, a bit hopeless, I guess. What I wanted to really stress though is that Chloe is not alone. Um, and I've noted here a report that was released by Headspace in 2020, and it actually surveyed Headspace centre service users, over 300, sorry, 3,500 young people. Um, and you can see there some of the stats, but essentially, you know, 75% of young people during 2020 um, of that group, that survey group, said that they definitely feel that their mental health has declined since the outbreak of COVID. Um, so I think, I think that's really important in terms of normalising and validating what Chloe's going through. Um, and I would certainly be seeking to do that in my work with her. Next slide, please. So naturally our journey would also start with a full psychosocial assessment as Michael um, noted. And I used to work in the Headspace Centre, so I've used that HEADS assessment countless times. <laughs> know it back to front um, and it is really good and also I'd also want to be just establishing a baseline as well by using some um, you know K10 I'd be used, looking at so far um, in terms of daily functioning um, and I really value feedback informed treatment also so I'd be um, using that approach as well in my work with Chloe. I think for me a really key focus is on looking at what factors are exacerbating, um, but also equally improving Chloe's presenting issues of low mood and um, lack of motivation. Again, I'd pay particular focus to risk and protective factors. So I can see a lot of um, crossover between what Michael spoke of and, and what I spoke of. And that's not surprising considering that mental health social workers, um, you know, are part of that allied health, obviously that group. Um, I'd be thinking about a full risk assessment, considering the, some of the presenting issues can be symptoms of depression um, and just ensuring that safety is ensured. Uh, but really, I just want to spend some time building rapport with Chloe. I'd want to get to know her. Um, I'd ask questions about her present circumstances, her, her part-time work, her family, her home environment, her friends. Um, her aspirations, she talked about nursing, um, and just her goals for the future. That would pretty much be my focus. 
Um, we know that access to education, employment, social participation and connectedness are all significant contributors to a young person's mental health and wellbeing um, and just their capacity to lead, lead a flourishing life. And actually, research shows that these social determinants can be more important than healthcare or lifestyle choices in influencing health. So that's a really big focus for me. Um, next slide, please. Uh, once I'd completed my assessment with Chloe, I would just, again, spend time with her talking about, about the assessment and the outcome of that. I really want to check my understanding of what's, what ha what's going on for her. Um, and especially considering the pandemic and Chloe's, I guess, lack of control um, and agency throughout what she has recently experienced, I would want to ensure her agency throughout this process and also her self-determination. Um, I'd want her to feel in control and, and that I understand her needs and, and the goals of treatment. Um, I'd really validate, as I said, her experiences. I'd normalise it. I'd talk about, you know, that Headspace report that actually you're not alone. Um, I'd highlight her strengths, her resilience and her personal resources as, as a real priority. Next slide, please. Um, I guess for me reading the case study, I thought I probably would, would be conscious not to over pathologize Chloe. I think I'd be feeling that, I'd be suspecting that maybe some brief intervention could fit for her. Um, and maybe an approach like solution focused therapy could work. Um, for me, I think this could be really good. Um, it's focused, it's goal oriented, it's solution focused, and it really assists clients to move uh, in that future oriented direction. Rather than spending um, too much time, I guess, focusing on the problem or the past, I'd be wanting to look to the future and um, what would be Chloe's ideal future and how would we know when she's there. Um, just one of the questions there that's highlighted exception questions. So really illuminating when is the problem not present? Uh, and I was wondering if Chloe's part-time work might be a good place to start to figure out, you know, how's that going for her? It seems like that, that's a real positive and a strength. Um, let's focus on that. In terms of practical supports, um, of course, be looking to re-establish a routine. Uh, again, that gives predictability and a sense of control for Chloe. Um, also like Michael, just, you know, things like daily exercise, sleep hygiene, social activity, all of those really basic um, self-care activities. And a bit of a wellbeing plan, I'd be thinking about um, particularly identifying early warning signs um, and stressors so that Chloe has a good understanding and good insight into what is it that could, um, I guess, result in a, a further decline in her mental state. Um, and of course, we know that when stress increases, so should our self-care because that's how we maintain our equilibrium. Um, so I guess depending on what Chloe feels comfortable with, I would potentially suggest we could invite her family to be a part of a session. Uh, for me, the main purpose of that would be to create shared understanding between Chloe and her family, um, but also to do some psychoeducation with family around, um, I, I guess, adolescence, developmental stages, what does that look like uh, and her symptoms. Next slide, please. I guess to Chloe doesn't seem like she it did talk a little bit about um, potentially getting income assistance, but I'm wondering whether she might be eligible for that, but also her parents, I'm wondering whether they might be eligible for some kind of income assistance. Um, so I'd be assessing that. And then in terms of her um, goal or desire to study nursing, I think that the digital work and study service through Headspace could be, be a great support for her. Um, and also her parents can access support through Headspace too. So um, yeah, I'd really be suggesting that that could be a good option for her if she, if she was into that. Uh, she had some really great role models in her aunts too, so they could be supportive throughout that process. Um, yeah, they're probably, probably the main thing. I guess just summarising, I, I really want to have a strength-based approach. 
uh, I'd want to be looking at some brief interventions and uh, maximising protective factors for Chloe. Wonderful. Thank you, Meg. That's fantastic. Um, I really like the notion of kind of getting to know her. I think that can be underestimated or under um, discussed in working with young people. Get Spend some time with her and uh, understand her and, and um, let her know that it you get it, it really sucks. Like it really sucks what uh, these young people are going through. So it's understandable. Um, and we've had some questions coming through and you've picked up on some of them around over pathologizing versus um, validating and that balancing act. So we'll, we might come back to that as well. A couple of quick questions. Yes, the slides are available. Uh, yes, the recording's available. Yes, we'll hand out some resources. So. Um, Let's keep going. I'm really um, keen to now hear from Anne and his perspective. So over to you. Thank you. And we need to unmute yourself, Anne. Oh, that's the number one error, not <laughs> unmuting yourself. Part of the year. Dear me, dear me. <laughs> So, so thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Meg. It's such an interesting uh, case. And um, Meg, I love that you talked about the definition of a trans transition uh, being uh, moving from one stage in life to another. And, and I actually, um, I, I, I'm very supportive of what you're, you have both said. And, and I look at it also from a, a slightly different angle where I, I look at it that life is actually a series of transformations and um, from, and if, we, if I could see my next slide, please, that we move from, uh, pre, you know, in the, for children, preschool to primary school, into high school, we move from child to adolescent to young adult uh, and into employment and adult life, uh, potentially become parents. And, and one of the biggest and most significant transformations or transitions is in fact from adolescent to young adult. And uh, my, my biggest concern uh, with Chloe would be is if we felt she was actually in immediate danger of uh, harm in any way. And if that is our conclusion, then, then we absolutely need to deal with that. But moving back from that, I actually think that what's happening with Chloe is a cultural issue. And, and we're seeing, uh, and from the research that Meg showed, that a, a huge percentage of teenagers, over half of them, are struggling at the moment. And, and part of it, and if we, you know, we're using Chloe as the case study, and her movement from adolescent to young adult has basically been put on hold and she hasn't been able to complete school properly. She hasn't been able to get into the course that she wants to get into. She hasn't been able to get her driver's license. All of these things that are so critical when, as an adolescent, these are the things that you're looking forward to. These are the things that signify that you are now gonna be an adult. And, and she's still had her birthdays, so that's still come around, but she is still very much feeling and being treated like an adolescent when she is absolutely ready to move into the adult world. And that in itself is going to create a big issue for her. And the other thing is that this transition that she's going through, I believe the transition from uh, or any stage is actually a community responsibility. And at the moment, it's like it's Chloe's responsibility or Chloe has to find a way to move herself from adolescent to young adult, whereas I believe the community, the community should be coming around Chloe and together creating something to help her move from child or from adolescent to young adult. And because we don't have the community doing that, we're therefore having to bring all sorts of resources in uh, and, and basically to pathologise to potentially support her in creating that transition. And, and if we only have one Chloe, that's okay. But if we have, you know, over 50% of the uh, teenagers in our community struggling in a similar way, and by the way, I think a huge number of them were struggling before COVID anyway. And, and I think COVID has actually exaggerated the problem rather than created the problem. Uh, and there's a lot of research which shows that the well-being 
uh, of, of uh, young people dipped considerably around 14, 15, 16, 17 years of age and that these are in fact uh, some of the highest risk ages. And for me, what I would like to see is actually a community process. I would like to bring together all of Chloe's class and I would like to bring together with her class her parents and I would like to bring together also if we could get grandparents in there and I would like to see them sitting around and I would like to have Chloe listen to the stories of her parents and her grandparents. And uh, we are in a stage where the resilience of our children is at an all time low because of the, you know, for many of them, the privileges and opportunities and, and probably you could say the lack of ad adversity that many of them have dealt with. And so when COVID's come into it and all of a sudden uh, some things have been cancelled and things can't happen. And, you know, really in Australia, relatively speaking, we've done very well. Um, but it's been very difficult for a lot, a lot of the teenagers. However, I would also love to have the teenagers listen to people like my father, who's 91 years old and lived through the World, world War II and lived through, um, you know, the Cold War and lived through some economic hardships and different things. And um, I, I think when the young ones get to hear from the elders that not, that not only, um, you know, that the young ones aren't the only ones who are struggling at this age, it's actually a very normal thing. And when they, they learn that, they, you know, Chloe could well think she is the only one who's struggling. But if we can create a scenario where Chloe can actually hear the stories of the other students her age and hear the stories of parents and grandparents and realise that to some level this period of life is difficult but hopefully it does pass and there are ways that we can get through it, I think that would be very therapeutic and positive for Chloe. And in our work and creating our programs around Australia and around the world, we've recognised some of the things that it takes and some of the things for teenagers to thrive. And I think this is saying similar to what Michael and Meg have said, but in a different way. So teenagers need a sense of belonging. Uh, and, and it feels to me like Chloe is very much on her own. Uh, teenagers need to create a vision and have a purpose. It also seems to me that Chloe doesn't have much of an, a vision or a purpose. Teenagers need an awareness of their own gifts and their talents and their genius and spirit. And once again, it doesn't seem like Chloe has that going on. And teenagers need an opportunity where they can sit with either other teenagers or adults or, or, or support people and be able to share what's actually going on for them, to be able to share vulnerably about what's happening and, and not be shamed for it and, and not even be pathologised for it. Just have that opportunity to share. And how beautiful to hear Meg say that she wanted to create rapport with Chloe. And once again, there's a lot of research coming out which shows that when a teenager has rapport with anyone who's older than them or anyone at all, that that teenager will do better in all areas of their lives, in their families, in their educational outcomes, and less likely to engage in delinquent behaviour. So absolutely, Chloe needs rapport. Chloe needs a space where having heard stories and having shared her own story, she can create a vision for the future. She needs elders to tell her that even though she's struggling, they see her and, and the aunties that we're talking about need a space to tell Chloe all the beautiful things they've seen about her growing up, all the things that they love and admire about her. And, and she needs a safe space to be able to work through this. And um, she, like many of the teenagers are struggling and, and yes, I agree with the psychometric assessments and, the, and all the support that we were talking about, but I'm also very interested uh, in how as a community we can be normalising the process of creating ceremonies, celebrations uh, and support networks for our, our young ones as they're going through these stages because I, I worry that our our networks like Headspace 
um, uh, are not, you know, that we're trying to replace what really, as I said earlier, should be a community responsibility um, uh, with, you know, allied health professionals who just get stretched so thin trying to support all of the different teenagers um, and all uh, what's going on with them. So, so that is the approach that I would take and, and really it comes down to what I discovered when I looked at communities around the world where they would create rites of passage. When, when the children reach that age uh, as a community, they create a celebration, they would share stories, create a vision, acknowledge the gifts of each of the children and their, their genius and their spirit, whatever you want to call it, create challenges for them to help them build up resilience. And, and basically, they would be creating a scenario that was mimicking what was going to happen for them as adults, but doing it in a safe, supportive way when they were younger, so that when they got to the difficult times, they had the coping mechanisms and the support networks to be able to get through them in a healthy way. And my final slide, if we can go to it, um, because in my work I realise a lot of what we do uh, now is we need to be building communities, and, and so we have a model called a golden check-in, and it's something that we encourage families to do, and uh, it's something that we encourage um, uh, teenagers to do with each other, and, and it's about when we check in with someone, instead of saying, how you going, or good, or fine, uh, that we actually go a little bit deeper. And in the golden check-in, we use the letters of the word golden. So G is how you're going overall. Uh, o is what, you, what have you been occupied with and what have you been doing. L, what have you liked recently. D, has anything been difficult. E, is there anything you're excited about or things that you're worried about. And N, what support do you need. And, and uh, we have found that just by creating, and it's this, this is the building rapport, and it's something that we can do once a week at the dinner table with our families. It's something that I often do at my work at the beginning of meetings. We just have a, a check-in that goes one level above uh, just saying that I'm good or fine and, and actually genuinely gives us an insight into how the other person's going because if we know how someone's going, then we can actually support them and, and give them what they need. So that's my angle and perspective on it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, I was sitting back listening to you. I was really enjoying it. Um, I love that scaffolded uh, conversation. I think, you know, we've done a great job in this country around encouraging people to check in with each other, um, you know, are you okay? And all of those sorts of things. Um, I think what's become more apparent over the last um, little while is that a lot of people don't know how to respond, you know, um, if you get a, 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 an answer that is not, um, I'm, I'm good, thank you. So I think also the, the notion that um, people need sometimes a bit more, they need to know that you're actually interested, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that it's not just a cursory tick box. Um, so I think that's a really lovely, um, way to, to support that, to have a conversation around, um, you know, what's going well but, and reflecting that we always have things that are going well and things that are challenging us at, at any point in time. I also love awareness of their genius and spirit. I'm going to, I've written that one down. I think um, one of my uh, observations and bugbears in life is that the dominant narrative around adolescence is that they're awful, <laughs> um, that it's a terrible point of life, that your children are going to turn into these creatures and, you know, how would we expect them to um, thrive if all they ever hear about themselves is that they're, they're awful critters when they're actually they're, they have genius and spirit. So I, I really appreciate that um, personally. So thank you. Okay, you guys have done an amazing job of uh, generating all of that in a, a really succinct amount of time, which thankfully gives us um, time for questions because this is where we can get into the, the nitty gritty a little bit. We've had a, a number of questions coming through. Um, so 
as we go into it, we can, we've got the pictures of us that we all love, our, our bio pictures. Um, you can actually change the view, guys, if you, those of you watching at home. Um, so you can um, see that all of us uh, while we're chatting, which might be more interesting than our, the, our pictures or it might be less flattering, I don't know. Um, if you change the slide view by looking at that icon, two arrows inside a circle in the top right hand side to change the view, makes the video larger and the slides smaller. <laughs> so now I'm going to go and throw to our panel. We've had some good questions um, coming through. I um, I wonder who might want to talk to the Maybe Michael, I'll throw this to you to start off with, if that's okay. Um, there's been a bit of a discussion about this, but one of the first questions we got as we came through is from um, Megan or Megan, I apologise, my sister-in-law is, is definitely a Megan and she hates it when I get it wrong, um, around is there a risk of medicalising or um, I suppose pathologising transition issues at, at the moment um, for, for somebody like Chloe and should we be normalising versus pathologising? Do you have a view on that? Oh, I think we've got to be uh, absolutely clear uh, not to pathologise. Um, I'd just emphasise that this was a, a hypothetical um, and so I might have egged it up a bit um, for, the, for the sake of the, um, the, the case study. Um, it is it, absolutely possible that um, she's uh, coping, um, that she's going to cope really well with this next uh, part of her life. Um, but I think we have to be alert to uh, the possibility that she isn't. Uh, you've heard the research that suggests that there, there are significant links between certain uh, risk factors and the development of uh, some uh, set problems, some set diagnoses. And um, I'm very, very happy to, to tell people that um, that uh, there's that, that particularly their their parents who often are the ones that worry or schools that uh, this young person is just going through a delightful uh, academic uh, adolescence um, and uh, that it's it's really something that um, uh, will develop over time so absolutely we should be aware of the danger of uh, pathologizing great. Thank you, Michael. Um, so any of the viewers that have been listening long intently, please add your questions in. We have got time to, to cover through a few of them. We do have a, a number from registration as well. So I won't get to all of them. I'm trying to group and cluster them together. So I apologize if your one isn't answered directly. Um, I'm going to throw this open. I'm sorry, guys, I haven't prepped you for this. Um, well, maybe I'll throw to you first, Meg, given you've worked a lot um, in the school setting. There's a question that's come through around uh, gender specific. Do we see particularly different um, challenges for um, different genders as they in these life transitions that you've observed? And feel free to say, I don't know or no and throw to anybody mm. else. It's a question without notice. Mm, great question. Oh, it's got me thinking. Um, I'd say the answer is yes, we probably would see gender differences. Mm. Um, with what they are, <laughs> mm. I'm not, not sure I can on the spot. Does anyone else have any, Anna, Anna or Michael? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. Mm. Um, so in my experience as a doctor, um, there were overall gender differences if you took a thousand uh, um, young people. What's really important is that just because someone uh, is a girl or was born a girl doesn't mean that she would necessarily uh, you know, exhibit what the overall girls would typically exhibit or same with the boys. However, what I noticed was that, for example, in the risk-taking behaviours that we see, that the boys are uh, was very much more about going out and, um, you know, looking for trouble and, and testing their mortality. 
Um, and, and that was why speed and, and, you know, they would build a jump and they would jump over it with their um, motorbike. And if they successfully landed it, the first thing they would do is they'd go back and they'd make it higher. Uh, and, and they'd make it higher. And, you know, it could only end in one way. And, and, and it was really about pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, and pushing it out there, facing fear, pain, and the possibility of death. Mm. And what I saw in emergency, and yes, there were some girls who did that, but very often I saw that the issues that the girls got into was when they would go inside and, and internalise their problems, and, and then from there the, the issues would happen. And when you threw the potential for drugs or alcohol in the um, mix, then it would just get a lot worse. And they would, oh, and we had things like schoolies, which, you know, by the way, we call a rite of passage, which I have a major issue with. And, and I saw many, many girls who did things on schoolies that were, um, or had things done to them on schoolies that were, were really quite tragic. But the interesting thing was when I would say to the girls who I would uh, be looking after in emergency, did you know beforehand, was there some voice saying in your head saying that this is not a good idea? And very often they knew. Very often they knew that what they were doing was, was not going to work out well, but they did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And when I would say to the boys, did you know before you did this, did you know that it was going to not work out well? And the boys would say, no, nah, didn't even think about it. So that was a gender difference that I saw. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very interesting that in the, in, the, in the rites of passage that were created for boys and girls, very often uh, traditionally the boys would have to do something that involved them being able to deal with pain, fear, or the potential of death. And the girls would have to do something, would, they would often put them on an internal journey where they would learn to trust their inner voice. Yeah. Now, in the rites of passage that we create now, uh, we don't, you know, we don't just say, oh, well, the boys have to do that and the girls have to do this. We want the boys to learn to trust and find their inner voice as well. And we want the girls to also get in touch with their inner warrior and their strength and their, their power in that way. Um, so uh, that's how we sort of work with it and, and part of how I look at it. That, thank you. That was, that's great. I think it's um, nothing is absolute, right? And, and certainly gender we know is not, but I think that's really interesting. I, I really like the notion of the stance of curiosity you're coming from, you know, and, and, and sitting with a young person and, and being curious about what that journey is such a terrible word, but you know, that what that experience was like and at, at what point were they trusting themselves or listening to the, themselves and not. And I think that reflective, modelling that reflective um, questioning is, is a really great um, place and we don't do it enough. I think, you know, we, we jump to lecture or uh, correct really quickly a lot of the time versus letting people um, come to their own conclusions. So um, thank you. Uh, got some really uh, other interesting questions coming through. Um, I wonder, um, Michael, maybe this one for you and I'll come back to you, Megan, I'll throw you one that maybe, uh, I don't feel like I'm throwing you quite so much under the bus, I apologise for that. Um, Michael, there's a question here from Belinda about young adults appearing to get stuck post-school, a lack of confidence in society and themselves and a comfort living at home and in the digital world, but not a deep satisfaction. Um, any thoughts on that, observations or, you know, how you might work with that as kind of an, an stuckness that we might see in some young people um, and on we about what where to next? Yeah, I mean, I think the two interesting things um, about that one is there's a sort of identity diffusion amongst some young people, not all, when they leave school, they're not entirely sure uh, about what's next. And I think Anna's absolutely right about um, the fact that there were problems pre-COVID, but I think there are now um, more young people who seem um, both stuck in your words, but also there seems to be amongst some of my clients a you only live once type mm -hmm. philosophy mm -hmm. where nothing matters now. Um, they can't do the things that they want to do. 
I've had young people tell me, you know, all well, the economies are stuffed and our politicians are useless and the world's burning up and, and uh, we'll all die of, of, of global warming. Um, so th- I, I think there is a, um, a pessimism there, uh, which has always made me feel a little bit sad because I, I, I've always um, associated young people, as you do, um, with hope and optimism and curiosity. So it worries me that um, some of my clients might be so um, pessimistic. So what do we, we do about that? I think that um, our major job is to provide hope and um, different ways of thinking. I, I think one of the key messages, if I had sort of one minute on on national t- uh, YouTube where every young person was listening, I think the message that I'd want to send, two messages would be, um, if in life you can't change something, you can always change the way you think about it and see life as it is, but for goodness sake, focus on the good bits. Mm, thank you. Um, yeah, just picking up, I think that they link in really nicely um, with some of the stuff that the other panellists have been saying. I know it reminds me, my dad is 80, 85 and I asked him the other day about, um, you know, his reflections on what we're going through given he lived through World War II in the UK and he said it was interesting, It's his um, he's been thinking more about that than he has for many, many decades. And I think those the sharing of stories and hope and that notion that, you know, say World War II that a lot of these kids' grandparents lived through, um, you know, six years of, t- of time and um, what that meant for them and what that meant for them and the, their life and grow- and uh, and hope and, and changes and transitions and things. There's a lot to be said for stories and sharing of stories of, of resilience. I think that's, um, there's, yeah, it's really important how, how we do that and how we give, um, validate what young people are going through but also give them hope about where, where to from here. Um, Meg, I want to throw to you, if that's okay, had a, a number of questions in the registrations but also this evening around the role um, that schools can play. Um, obviously mm. we've got Chloe who's leaving year um, 12 and I think we all hope that that would be that cohort that were impacted but clearly we've still got COVID, <laughs> we still have lockdown, we um, I've got two nieces in the UK who are just about to finish their degree who have done two years out of their three-year degree pretty much in lockdown Mm. Um, and they're looking to see, you know, maybe come to the Southern Hemisphere for the next stage. Um, So I'm wondering about, you know, schools and other institutions, what they can do with the current cohorts or how we can maybe support them as they're looking forward to their transitions um, perhaps into this uncertainty and and, um, instability that you mentioned. Yeah, certainly. Um, in my experience, so as I mentioned earlier, Headspace Schools, the division of Headspace National, um, one of the biggest contracts of the schools division is BU. Um, and so we support schools around whole school wellbeing um, in terms of frameworks for that, um, building mental health literacy of educators and also building their capacity to support our young people and their school community in general. So. I talk a lot with schools about, um, I guess, the risks of transitions, um, of poor transition, but how do we also put strategies in place to enhance um, and maximise protective and healthy transitions. Um, And schools have been doing this for years and years and years. They're they're really good at um, supporting transitions, you know, not only from say uh, kindy to prep, um, but then year six to year seven, and I know that's new in Queensland, I'm from New South Wales, that's normal to me. Um, And then from year 12 to year 13, as we call it. Um, And so in my role, I've supported a number of schools increasingly who are looking at that year 13 as I guess a pretty big, um, it's a pretty big risk time in young people's lives. Mm. Um, And I was thinking just before when Anna was talking about that you know males are far less likely to help seek um and yeah definitely that you touched on as well Anna around you know in terms of their behaviors they're they're much more I guess destructive um so thinking about how can schools be mindful of that and what can they put in place to maximize protective factors during their senior schooling years so that um you get you have more likely to have that healthy transition and I think I'll touch on just a couple of them. Um, you know, a big one for me is early support. 
So what's in place to um, make sure that there are support pathways, um, that young people know how to help seek, um, that parents and families are aware of local services, know about referral pathways, you know, all these sorts of things. Schools can do a lot in that space. Um, and then family partnerships. So thinking about um, getting groups of parents together to share their concerns around their young person graduating. Um, Normalise it, validate it again, but then use that as a resource. Um, and I guess that's what Anna was talking about too, is that using our communities, mm -hmm. our organic communities to maximise protection and, and um, reduce risk. So I think, yeah, there's a lot that schools can do. I could probably go on for a long time. Um, a really key thing too is some schools call it like a life skills program, um, but essentially it's part of their curriculum. And so it's um, commandeered time, maybe once a week, where young people learn life skills. So what does it mean to help seek? What does it mean to support a friend or identify that a friend isn't going so well? Um, how do I talk to my mum or my dad or my grandparents if I'm struggling? You know, what does that actually look like and, and, and practicing those skills and also maybe looking at developing a wellbeing plan? This can all be done in school so that when that young person doesn't have that um, natural support network, they've got some strategies, they've got some skills, they've got a bit of a plan and hopefully um, we'll be able to catch them early. And I, one final thing I'll say is, a strategy that I've seen used, and, and this is a little bit resource heavy, so it's not possible for all schools, but is looking at um, young people within year 12 who might be showing some, I guess, indicators that they might not transition well. Um, so at risk of poor transition, I guess. So, and then wrap around some supports around them whilst they're in year 12. Um, upskill their parents so that they can be that support network for them when once they've graduated. And then if they can, keep in touch with the student or the family for the first 90 days of their graduation. Um, mm -hmm. Check in and it, that's a really great opportunity to course correct early if things mm -hmm. are going wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Big, um, just picking up on some of the points there, I know there's um, challenges with services, right? Services are full across the country now more so than ever. Um, I certainly know across the, the work that we're doing, um, and networks often, uh, and rural and remote regions, there is um, online services, uh, telehealth, the terrible word, um, web facilitated chap and so forth. I wonder, Michael, I know this is an area that you're interested in. Um, you could talk a bit about that. It's an area that I think when we have conversations around it, there is mixed messaging about people like it, people don't like it. I think it, it's, um, yeah, I was what, interested in your view about what's, uh, what people's views are about this and how they might be useful for, for young people transitioning. Well, I think the, um, uh, mental health services are uh, dramatically underfunded. You'd expect me to say that, and I, I think it's true. Um, and therefore, I think we are increasingly reliant on e-therapies. Um, and I think that Australia probably leads the world in the development of um, things like um, mood, gym. Um, I'm thinking about the wonderful apps that Reach Out have put out in terms of Reach Out Breathe, Reach Out Worry Time. Um, I'm thinking about an organisation I used to be on the board of, Smiling Mind, and their uh, incredible work uh, promoting uh, mindfulness. Um, and uh, look, I think we have to be really um, proactive in this, and I think that it is not um, everybody's cup of tea, but I also think a lot of this is the way in which we as clinicians mm. introduce young people to mm. uh, these apps and uh, websites, and uh, I would always do so in a way that was immensely respectful of the young people. I wonder if you would like to trial this for me is a much better um, kind of attitude than here's an app, go use it, which I fear some people do. 
I think it's a really good point. I, mean, I think sometimes when I have conversations, the people who are telling me that young people won't use them at my age, <laughs> I'm like, have you asked a young people person? Because I have two teenagers at home and they have no problem whatsoever connecting um, and uh, with their friends constantly um, via Xbox or Snapchat or, you know, that's their social connection. So, yeah, I think we have to be cautious about our own view of what is and isn't. And certainly some of the young people I've dealt with prefer it. You know, there's a, a preference for that versus face-to-face. -face. The um, privacy is an issue, you know, is mum listening at the door, you know, versus in the therapy room, we might be able to keep it further away. So there's, I think, it, it, yeah, it's really good. I love that idea of asking them to try it and, um, you know, do a critique for us, look at these different ones and tell us, yeah, that agency and bringing people into the conversation is a great one. Um, and I am keen to come to you. We've got um, a number of questions around rites of passage in different cultures and the use of, of ceremony and so forth. Um, it's got a question from Linda. Rites of passage in different cultures also teaches teenagers the responsibilities of becoming an adult and trains them in living skills before they celebrate their transition into adulthood. Can we work with teenagers on issues around finance, time management, et cetera, to help them become independent? Is that something you see as helpful in this space? Absolutely. I think one of the things I found from the rites of passage that I studied was that they all did it in the same, using the same uh, elements, uh, but it would it would modify according to which community it was in and where the community was at. So, so I look at it with schools. Now, our ch when our children go into school, they are young children. They're, they're almost babies. And my hope would be that by the time they leave school, they're actually young adults and they're equipped and they have an understanding of what it means to be a young adult and they have some of the, the key 21st century skills, which is what we're calling these days of resilience and adaptability and curiosity and emotional intelligence and, and various other skills that we can be teaching them. And, and uh, I think what happens in year 13 and when they first leave school is a very strong indicator that there's something we're really not doing well because we see legions of kids going to Byron Bay, the Gold Coast, Bali, Fiji, as soon as they leave school, the next day they're on a plane and they're out there and they're drinking as much as they could and they're looking for drugs and they're, and they're having inappropriate sex and, you know, unfortunately too many of them, not all of them obviously, but too many of them are getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that the role of schools has to be not just to give our children a, an academic result, it absolutely has to also be to educate and to support our kids so that the transition into young adulthood has happened as much as possible before they leave school. And I also think we can't just leave that up to the schools and we can't just leave it up to the allied health services to support the kids who are struggling. Once again, it has to be a community responsibility within the schools. And like Meg, I'm now doing most, if not 90% of my work in schools. And it's about rebuilding communities within the schools, getting the parents involved, getting the parents actually involved with each other so that they're not only supporting their own children, but all the parents are supporting all the children. And we, for example, say to the parents, get to know your children's friends. And in fact, you may well be able to have a better conversation with one of your children's friends than you can with your own child at certain times. And we, and we want all the children to know that if they have a problem and they, for whatever reason, are not comfortable to speak to their own parent, that there are other parents or aunties or people that they can go to. So all sorts of uh, community building activities that we can do starting in kindergarten and going all the way through. And then at key times, like for example, the year nine camp and transforming year nine camps from activities where they go abseiling and bushwalking and kayaking to actually at least a part of that camp is an opportunity for them to talk about, okay, well, how do I wanna be as an adult? What's my vision? What sort of relationships do I wanna have? How am I gonna treat the people who I'm in relationships with? What are the things that I need to let go of if I'm going to become that person? Mm -hmm. And also somewhere in there, like I mentioned before, either the teachers or if we can get their parents involved or their peers 
actually speaking to each of them and recognise and naming what are the gifts and genius and talents and spirit that we see in them. So that, you know, a couple of years before they're leaving school, they've already started this concept of creating a vision. Mm. They're comfortable to share with their peers and in fact, with their teachers, there's, there's, as I mentioned earlier, there's research coming out that if there's a mentoring relationship between teachers and students, the students do better on every level. Yeah. And what we're often finding is that mentoring relationship happens in the primary school, but once they get up into the high school, the teachers are often coming in, delivering their information and leaving, and, and, the, and the students are not getting that mentoring relationship to the degree that they potentially could. So it's by bringing these things back in and using things like school camps that I think we can be doing a lot of preventative and positive work with the students. Thank you. I love that. My brain's pinging <laughs> all over the place. It just, as you're saying that, I was remembering in primary school, um, when my kids were in primary school, they would come home with a poster and everybody had written on a post-it note something they noticed or admired about them. Yeah. We do that with little kids. Why aren't we doing it with our year nines? You know, the, um, Who are so know, desperate for it. They are yeah. so desperate for someone to tell them that they see them, That's that right. they love them, that they admire them. You know, a lot of these kids who are really acting out are also hugely talented. Of course they are, yeah, exactly. And they just need yeah. someone to tell them that they see them. Yeah, well, that's it. one of the things they need. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I have to have to wrap it up. I don't want to, but I do. Um, I'm going to throw to each of you um, now, and I'll re return to the, the natural order just for a, for a couple of minutes. Um, we've we've talked around. I really like the fact that we've had a good amount of time for Q and A. It also always means we get into the, the nitty gritty a bit. But um, Michael, you mentioned before if you had a, a minute of, of YouTube time, um, but I was wondering if there's anything you wanted to add. You've got a couple of minutes now to to wrap it up. Key messages around what we've been talking um, about tonight that you'd like people to take away. Yeah, I'm really worried about young people in uh, 2021. Um, I really don't like the media uh, narrative at the moment. And um, as a person who works in the media, um, tr trying to, to counter that is uh, a very high priority for me. Um, I think that we need to celebrate uh, the, uh, I think someone used the word genius um, and I'd actually add the curiosity yeah. um, around young people. I think they're, uh, they need to see and hear some positive um, reflections of themselves uh, and uh, we really need to call out the negativity when it, when it happens. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to, to thank you for your superb um, facilitation of this evening and say thank you very much to my fellow presenters. I think you're all brilliant. Thank you, Michael. It's been a great conversation. Meg, um, how about from you, a couple of key takeaways that you'd like people to think about? Yeah. Um, well, I just echo what Michael said first, that, yeah, really great to be on the panel with you all tonight. Um, I think for me, I, I, I challenge that young people aren't resilient. I, I think they're especially resilient. Um, I think they are critical thinkers and they think outside the box and they're not willing to accept maybe what generations before them did. Um, and I really admire that. Um, so I think, yeah, I think they are resilient and I think they have an abundance of skills and inherent resources and it's our job to help them uncover those. Mm. That's that's what I would say. And, and I think the earlier we do that, the better. So I love that I work with schools. I love that I work with educators um, and really building their capacity to do that work. Um, I'd say family partnerships are essential. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Arne, over to you. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm both worried and optimistic. I think <laughs> COVID has created some incredible opportunities. It's brought a lot of families home and it's brought, you know, so many families I've spoken to, the kids have left home recently and then they got them back for another year again. And 
Some families really struggle with that, but other families have told me it's been astonishing, you know, just having that time again and, and, and the things that they've been doing together. And, and I think also I've really noticed a shift in schools with this genuine realisation that wellbeing is not just a, uh, you know, a box at the bottom of a spreadsheet, mm -hmm. that it, it is actually a critical part uh, of the, um, the education of our children. And more and more schools are looking for genuinely positive, impactful wellbeing programs. Uh, and I love that. And, and uh, you know, in terms of our work, which, which I've been doing for 25 years, more and more schools are going, you know, what, what do we need to be doing? They're at least asking the questions, what do we need to be doing to genuinely equip our children with the skills they need for when they leave school and when they get to year 13. So mm -hmm. I'm seeing a really big shift uh, and, and I'm a big fan of, of young people. In our work, it's all about, you know, finding what is special and wonderful about them. So we're lucky that we get to see the extraordinary side of mm -hmm. these young people. And I think if we can bring that out more and more, you know, that actually gives me hope for the future. That's a great note to finish on. Um, I just want to double down on one of your other messages. I think in a lot of the work I've done and, and some of it's around um, following community trauma events and other things is uh, talking to young people about who they can talk to. Um, young people are incredibly conscious of the burden on parents and um, not wanting to talk out of turn or not, not wanting to worry parents when they're particularly stressed in Chloe's circumstances. It's a good example. So actually letting kids know who they can talk to and they won't kind of be talking out of school or betraying um, the confidence of their families, I think is a really good message to A, let them know that it's okay to talk, B, to encourage them to do it, but C, to, so they so they know what their options are. I think that's a really good message. Anyway, we have to wrap it up. I can talk underwater, so I'll stop. Um, I want to thank you all so much. I think it's been a fantastic uh, conversation uh, for everybody. Um, I've really enjoyed it and I hope the participants have, no doubt they have. Um, you can let us know. That's what we really need to <coughs> do. Um, we take it really seriously. We get really comprehensive feedback and it helps us shape what else we do. So please um, click on the pie chart icon in the lower right hand corner of your screen um, beside the speech bubble to fill out the survey or you'll get a pop up at the end of the webinar. Um, you will get some follow up communication from MHPN with a recording. So you will get the recording. All of the um, webinars that MHPN do are uh, available. I encourage you to have a look at them. There's some fantastic historical ones there. I, I often go in there myself to have a look at topics. Um, we've got upcoming uh, webinars. Please have a look for MHPN emails about things that are coming up. Um, in June, we're having a webinar on adjustment disorder. There's actually a question about that in the pre-question, um, so that will be relevant. We also have a podcast series, or MHPN do. Um, I feel like I belong to the family. Trauma and Resilience series, their podcast, is available on Apple, Spotify, or from the MHPN website. There's also local networks. Um, check them out. There's over 373 networks across the country. And finally, before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you everybody for your participation, for the questions, for the panelists and all of you for your interest. Um, go well and good evening. Thanks very much. <laughs>